Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are now exploring the fourth chapter we reached. Today we will start the 18th paragraph. This is 23rd episode. Today we will be exploring the path of devotion. In the previous episode, we explored the path of knowledge, how if the path of knowledge exclusively focus on the individual liberation, it may end up with this realization of the eternal, timeless, immutable self and treat the world as an illusion. But at the same time, there is a possibility for the path of knowledge to also look at the world as a manifestation of the divine and to realize the integral knowledge from the formless self to the manifest play, how the transmission from the most subtle to the most manifest concrete forms, how it unfolds, that knowledge will be an appropriate aim for the path of knowledge if it wants to be integral to take up. And uh, so with that broad overview, the limitation of path of knowledge, as well as its potential larger integration. Now let's move on to the path of devotion. The path of devotion aims at the enjoyment of the supreme love and bliss and utilizes normally the conception of the Supreme Lord in his personality as the divine lover and enjoyer of the universe. So this is the unique aspect of the path of devotion, the personality of the Supreme Self as the lover and the enjoyer of the universe, the manifest world, is key to it. Whereas in the path that follows the trails of knowledge into the formulas, they are very comfortable with the notion that the deepest, the highest existence is formless. And devoid of all personality, everything, no qualities, nothing. It is the pure emptiness, pure void, formless. They are very comfortable in the path of knowledge. But when it comes to the path of love and devotion, the form of the divine, the personality of the divine become very important because the heart needs an image of the divine. So even when we look at the various branches of Buddhism, even though the formless emptiness is considered as the ultimate realization, the very form of Buddha become the beloved, the love for Buddha and Buddha's wisdom and his compassion. They wouldn't use much of the word love and delight. They would use the word compassion, love for all beings, the metta, love for all beings. That become the way the love accommodates itself. Love uses the form of the divine, the personality of the divine through one or other forms of the beloved. If it is in Hinduism, it may be through Vishnu, Shiva, Krishna, or any of those forms, but not so much Brahma, Brahman. That is path of knowledge into the formless. Those who follow the path of love, it is predominantly Krishna who we will be finding as the form that is mostly worshipped. And the path of devotion requires the personality as the connecting link. And the path is of love, not so much knowledge. The heart is the faculty that is used, the principle of that love and its movement. And on that path, the bliss is the natural consequence. We will not find much 
in reference to bliss in the path of knowledge. Whereas in the path of love, bliss is the key. The path of devotion aims at the enjoyment of the supreme love and bliss and utilizes normally the conception of the Supreme Lord in his personality as the divine lover and the enjoyer of the universe. So this deity worship, temples and deity worship, all that emerged in India at a time when it is it was the path of love and devotion that was growing and spreading in India. And that was also the easier path for the masses to enter into the spiritual path through love and devotion without having to enter into the scholastic, scholarly understanding of the deeper dimensions of existence. A mere love for the divine is enough to enter the path. A pure love for the divine is enough to enter. Now, what is the way? That is where the deity worship, the rituals, the ceremonies, beautiful ceremonies, and the aesthetics, the beauty, the art, music, all that came into picture as the very means to enter. Love for the divine. That was enough to enter into the path. So his personality as the divine lover and enjoyer of the universe. The Lord is also its enjoyer and lover. And as the seeker seeks the beloved, so does the master seeks the devotee. All that is part of the path of devotion and the dance and ecstasy in merging with the divine. All that are part of it. The world is then realized as a play of the Lord with our human life as its final stage, pursued through different phases of self-concealment and self-revelation. Play, hide and seek. The divine veils himself in the complexity of the world and the seeker has to find the beloved who is hiding behind the veil and at the same time drawing you with magnetic charm to find the divine and drawing you through the attraction of the beautiful beloved out there who is not giving you an easy access at the same time not leaving you in complete des despair giving you the glimpses, come, come this way, come this way, and the search of the seeker for the beloved and the yearning of the heart. All these are the themes of the path of love, path of devotion, and its beautiful path, most enjoyable path. So the world is then realized as a play of the Lord with our human life at its final stage. The human life in the spiritual conception, goes through this various cycles of rebirth, going through all these earlier forms of life, eventually arriving at human form, where you can consciously recognize the beloved and unite with the beloved. So with our human life at its final stage, pursued through the different phases of self-concealment and self-revelation, so the divine conceals himself in the form and also divine reveals in the form. Now, you may conceive the divine as male, as female, as all these variants of both, all that are possible through the path of love and devotion. The principle of bhakti yoga is to utilize all normal relations of human life into which emotions enter, enters and apply them no longer to transient worldly relations, but to the joy of the all loving, all beautiful and all blissful. So on the path of yoga, we utilize our mundane relationships into which normally the emotions flow into. 
everything become a window through which you are looking at the beloved who is behind so even a child is looked upon like krishna who is present in your life as a child no who is it krishna and you try to see the divine behind that form so you love the divine with its intimacy and you love your child same way your spouse you look at the spouse as the divine just like in uh, yagnavalkya's um brihadaranyaka uh, upanishad where he refers to your husband or wife is dear for the sake of the self it is the divine who is indwelling in the spouse therefore the spouse is dear beloved so every relationship if you are entering the path of love and devotion you look at every relationship from that window so that you see behind the veil behind the concealment who is dwelling behind it playing with you fighting with you all the quarrels of the normal life is seen from that angle all the challenges of the that life is seen from that angle so when you encounter a difficulty you are asking the beloved why are you testing me like this in this life why don't you reveal your true form i am not able to see you behind your hiding veil so please show me and don't test me so much show me your presence so the principle of bhakti yoga is to utilize all normal human relations utilize all the normal relations of human life into which emotions enter because emotions are the rich carrier of our soul movement emotions enters and apply them no longer to transient worldly relations but to the joy of the all loving the all beautiful and all blissful that is a conception of the divine on the path of yoga it's all beautiful all blissful all loving god is love that is what christ said he opened for him and in that part of the world the path of love and devotion but except this aspect of all beautiful all all loving yes but all beautiful all blissful is not so much touched upon but in indian traditions we see it, the beloved is all beautiful all blissful not only all loving love the very ocean of love in which we exist is continuously contemplated upon every relationship is looked from that perspective and connecting with people from that perspective not only with people but also with all beings everything in existence is seen from that angle and the more you are tuned with it more you see the beauty of the play of existence play of life and every form would reveal the all beautiful all blissful all loving that's the promise of the path of love worship and meditation are used only for the preparation and increase of intensity of the divine relationship so the worship the ritualistic forms of worship is very much part of the path of love path of devotion and uh, even meditation is used to meditate upon the beloved so the worship and meditation are used only for the preparation of the increased intensity of the divine relationship on the path of knowledge meditation is to arrive at knowledge and experience and on the other hand in the path of devotion it is to intensify the relationship with the divine 
to connect with the divine and enjoy that relationship. That's where even meditation is directed because the meditation can be directed in different ways. And meditation can lead to realization of the formulas. That is one possibility. Meditation can real, lead to absorption and merging with the beloved in the all beautiful, all blissful, all loving. So worship and meditation are used only for the preparation and increase of intensity of the divine relationship. So this yoga is catholic in its use of all emotional relations so that even enmity and opposition to God considered as an intense, impatient and perverse form of love is conceived as a possible means of realization and salvation. So even the enmity to God, fighting with God, all that is allowed and conceived from this point of view. I am fighting with you. I will oppose you. But who are you? You are the Lord. And everything is allowed in that, even the perverse form of love, that impersonal and perverse form of love. So let me read that line again. And this yoga is catholic in its use of all emotional relations, so that even the enmity and opposition to God, considered as intense and imp intense, impatient and perverse form of love, is conceived as a possible means of realization and salvation. This path, too, as ordinarily practiced, leads away from world existence to an absorption, to another kind than the monists in the transcendent and supra-cosmic. Here again, if it is the way it is ordinarily practiced, tend towards absorption and withdrawal from the world into that absorption, but a different types of absorption than the one who is that monistic path where you are conceiving the formulas and merging and disappearing in the formulas. That is one type of absorption. Here it is another type of absorption emerging into the beloved. In that merging, there is a, another way of withdrawing from the world and rejection of the world. All that follows from that absorption. So this path too, as ordinarily practiced, leads away from world existence to an absorption of another kind than the monists in the transcendent and supra-cosmic. Supra-cosmic is that which is beyond the cosmos, beyond the manifestation, beyond time and space. So that's where it can lead to. But here too, the exclusive result is not inevitable. So that complete absorption and withdrawing from the worldly existence, it is not inevitable. The yoga itself provides a first corrective by not confining the play of divine love to the relations between the Supreme Soul and the individual, but extending it to a common feeling and mutual worship between the devotees themselves united in the same realization of the supreme love and bliss. So the very path of love, since it converts all human relationships into the relation with the divine, that very framework allows the relationship between the devotees to connect with each other, united in that one beloved. We are all united in our love for one master, one divine, one existence. So that is a good uh, provision that can protect you from the complete absorption into the supreme. 
And so the yoga itself provides a first corrective by not confining the play of the divine love to the relation between supreme soul and the individual. So that's one relationship. If you confine your relationship, I am only directly connecting with the divine. I have nothing to do with the people around. There is only the divine and your conception of the divine is beyond the world. Then it is the soul relating to the supreme directly. It bypasses the worldly relationships. Instead of that exclusive relationship of the soul with the divine, if you are also looking at everyone around is nothing but the expression of the divine behind the veil. Only when that perspective is brought in, that is where the yoga brings the corrective. There is the divine in human beings existing and every being around, not only human, every form of existence is inhabited by that. When that perception is brought in, brought in there is the right corrective. So the yoga itself provides a first corrective by not confining the play of divine love to the relation between the supreme soul and the individual, but extending it to a common feeling and mutual worship. Common feeling and a mutual worship between the devotees themselves, united in the same relation of the supreme love and bliss. So this is providing the corrective. So it binds a group of people in their common love and they are, they are seeing in each other the same master, same beloved. So that creates a collective mutuality and a relationship in the collective. So it provides a yet more general corrective in the realization of the divine object of love in all beings, not only human, but animal, easily extended to all forms, whatever. So that's where you relate not only to people, but also to the animals and every other form of existence. Then it's a broad general correction where the entire creation, the manifest world, the prakriti around, the nature around, you're relating to everything as nothing but the divine presence who is behind the veil. That's the most beautiful part of it. There is all beautiful in all forms, all loving, all blissful. We can see how this larger application of the yoga of devotion may be so used as to lead to the elevation of the whole range of human emotion sensation and aesthetic perception to the divine level. Its spiritualization and the justification of the cosmic labor towards love and joy in our humanity. So there is this elevation, refinement and elevation of the human emotion and sensation and aesthetic perception. Everything gets refined and elevated to the noble merging and noble perception of the divine in all things. And that also justifies the role of emotion. Why did evolution came up with this rich experience of emotion? Just like why did evolution come up with this rich experience of knowledge? And knowledge justifies its existence when the journey of knowledge leads and culminates in the knowledge of the divine. Same way, the experience of the emotion, which starts with our interpersonal relationships where we experience a deep connection. And what is the justification for that existence, that experience? This is early steps that can refine, that can grow and eventually move towards love for the divine and realization of the divine. And that's where the very faculty of the heart and emotions find its justification in the cosmic existence. Why 
the evolutionary process created this in the first place. There is a rich experience of the divine in all things possible through the heart. Therefore, it is justified. So we can see how this larger application of the yoga of devotion may so used, may be so used as to lead to the elevation of the whole range of human emotion, sensation and aesthetic perception to the divine level. Its spiritualization and, justi and the justification of the cosmic labor towards love and joy in humanity. There is a cosmic labor. We think it is our own human labor of love. But there is a cosmic labor of love to which we can open to. It is nature's own labor. There is a cosmic labor of love in nature. And our experience of our little human labor of love is actually part of the larger cosmic labor of love. And this we can realize through this path. When we look from that perspective and approach the path from that perspective. So with that, we come to the end of this path of love. Thank you for your presence, your continuous journey. Share with me your observations, your experiences, your journey. and. Uh, See you next week.